the 19th century, Herman Melville wrote of the Pacific, there is one knows not what sweet mystery about this sea, whose gently awful stirrings seem to speak of some hidden soul beneath. This mysterious, divine Pacific zones the world's whole bulk about, makes all coasts one bay to it, seems the tide-beating heart of Earth. In this 20th century, the world is growing more and more aware of this strategic area, once explored by Magellan and Cook, and immortalized by Stevenson and Conrad. And now these once remote lands are covered with the evidences of modern history. The tie between the Pacific world and the United States, first established by the visits to the Orient of Yankee merchant ships, has grown increasingly strong through the years. Today, the affairs of this republic and the Pacific world are inextricably interwoven. A modern author, James A. Michener, has written of this mighty sea. Our men lie buried there. Our ships and planes are in its bosom. And I am convinced that along its shores will be determined the precise quality of our future. The war which engulfed the Pacific in 1941 marked the beginning of a new era in the history of that part of the Earth. Never again could the Pacific Basin remain detached from the forces which were shaping the course of world history. The first truly global war brought to the Pacific the look of destruction and the smell of death, already familiar in other parts of the Earth. The word Pacific no longer meant an ocean paradise of peace. For countless centuries, the peoples of the Pacific were largely untroubled by international crises. Life was simple for the natives of most of the lands touched by the world's largest ocean. It once seemed wildly improbable that the people of these remote regions and the exotic lands they inhabited would one day be swept into the main current of the Earth's affairs. The United States first became vitally interested in the Pacific world following the extension of America's frontiers westward. In the mid-19th century, the young republic pushed its way across the 3,000 miles separating its east and west coasts. The attention of pioneering America was focused on the territory which lay along the western shores of the continent. With the acquisition of Oregon and California, the United States became an important force in the affairs of the Pacific world. But the coastline did not check America's expansion westward. The same spirit which motivated the exploration of the western United States prompted other Americans, men like Secretary of State William H. Seward, to extend the range of American influence into the Pacific Basin itself. With the purchase of Alaska from Russia in 1867, the United States gained a bastion from which control of the North Pacific area could be effected. America's new territory was rugged, magnificent country. For well over a century, this land had been ruled by the demands of the Russian fur trade. No serious attempt at colonization and development had been made by its former owner. In the early days of U.S. control, Alaska was a land of opportunity to a number of Americans who had failed in their attempt to make a fortune, but who still hoped to succeed one day. The discovery of gold in Alaska in the 1880s provided a strong incentive for Americans to migrate to the new territory. 
An orderly system of land surveys was inaugurated before the turn of the century, and a succession of homestead laws became effective. But in spite of Alaska's natural advantages, the development of the new territory was a slow process. Attempts to speed up colonization were hampered by the frequently unfavorable climate. In many parts of Alaska, the weather was suitable for outdoor work for only a brief period each year. Early in the 20th century, work was begun on the Alaska Railway, which upon completion was to cover 500 miles of territory. But despite these intimations of progress, Alaska remained a sprawling, undeveloped outpost, whose new residents were clustered in a few towns along its southern shore. To the south, the Hawaiian Islands became a link in America's Pacific frontier in the closing years of the 19th century. Hawaii lies directly in the path of the trade winds. Its soft, provocative climate helps make it one of the most popular of American possessions. Hawaii today is dotted with evidences of its colorful history. Its discoverer, Britain's Captain James Cook, is commemorated on the island of Hawaii. And the memory of the reign of King Kamehameha I is kept vividly alive throughout the islands. This popular monarch, revered by the islanders as the Napoleon of the Pacific, fostered a closer relationship with the United States. Hawaiians are a happy, hospitable people. Today, the Polynesian strain, in its pure form, is not as prevalent as it was in former years, due to years of intermarriage with other racial groups. Ancient Polynesian customs are still celebrated, in much the same spirit their ancestors observed, in the days before the coming of the white man several generations ago. All the islanders, of whatever racial stock, revel in the native ceremonies, but life in Hawaii also has its modern commercial side. Honolulu, the crossroads of the Pacific, is the business hub of the Hawaiian archipelago. For many years, a few principal industries supported most of the Hawaiian population. Hawaii's increasing development and continued prosperity are associated directly with the size and quality of its crops of pineapple and sugar cane, the island's chief exports. Technical improvements in growing cane and extracting the sugar content have made the Hawaiian industry a more efficient operation than any of its mainland competitors. But Hawaii's principal industry was destined soon to be war work. Home base of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, Hawaii assumed a tremendous importance as a U.S. war with Japan became a distinct possibility. Strategically situated almost midway between the American mainland and the home islands of Japan, Hawaii would inevitably be directly concerned if war broke out. With the tension in the Pacific increasing, army units continued their rehearsals for a defense of the Hawaiian Islands against a possible enemy attack. To the west, in the far reaches of the Pacific, the United States acquired a valuable Far Eastern outpost in Guam in 1898, following the war with Spain. For many years, the new American territory retained its largely primitive complexion. Habits of life passed along from generation to generation were not quickly altered. When Trans-Pacific Plain Service was established in 1936, Guam was made a regular stop and the island became an even more important link in the chain of American possessions in the Pacific Basin. And it was quite apparent that the U.S. recognized its importance. American rule was strict but paternalistic. The governor and his associates were Navy officers appointed to their posts, and the affairs of the island were regulated in precise military fashion. In 40 years, the Guamanian population increased from 9,000 to 22,000, a rise which can be directly attributed to public health measures initiated by the Navy. <laughs> 
Guam was predominantly Catholic, like the Philippines, also wrested from Spanish rule by the U.S. at the end of the 19th century. In the Guamanians, the United States had gained an intensely loyal people. Under American rule, the people were classed as nationals, but were not granted the privileges of citizens of the United States. Most Guamanians, whose lives had improved somewhat in recent years, looked hopefully toward the day when they might attain the status of full U.S. citizenship. The U.S. was not the only great power gaining a foothold in the Pacific. In a strategic position in the southwestern region lie two important members of the British Commonwealth of Nations, Australia and New Zealand. These down-under countries have made Great Britain a more active participant in the affairs of the Pacific for the past several generations. The modern cities of the two lands today are inhabited by the descendants of the British settlers who migrated to British Oceania. This thoroughly Occidental society developed and flourished, though it was more than 10,000 miles removed from the mother country, almost halfway around the globe. Today, Australia and New Zealand are autonomous communities within the British family of nations. An industrious and progressive people, Australians and New Zealanders show an obvious pride in the steady growth of their countries. Although both nations have made considerable progress in developing their rich agricultural resources, there is still room for expansion, particularly in New Zealand and in the reclamation of Australian badlands. Both down-under countries exist on an export economy, for even if the purchasing power of the Australian and New Zealander were substantially increased, they could not possibly consume the enormous meat and dairy yield. The livelihood of both Australians and New Zealanders has been dependent directly on Britain's purchases of their produce. As these purchases fall off, Australia and New Zealand are confronted with the problem of finding and expanding new markets. For the problem of developing independent economies successfully could be solved only by the two dominions themselves. But while the bonds of empire were no longer as strong in a material and political sense, the spiritual tie between the dominions and the seat of the British Commonwealth of Nations remained as firm as ever. For centuries, the countries of Southeast Asia have constituted a potential trouble spot in the Pacific world. In the 30s, the stirrings of nationalism became evident in these heavily populated countries, peopled by a great variety of ethnic groups. Siam began to agitate for the return of territory allegedly usurped by the French in the 19th century. Its people dreamed of a greater Thailand, and a close bond was established with the Japanese, who sided with the Siamese in their modest territorial expansion program. Hub of the Oriental world for thousands of years, China held a dominant position in the Pacific Basin throughout most of the 19th century. China's principal point of contact with the outside world for almost a hundred years was Shanghai, where British business interests first established a foothold. The economic life of all of China was related directly to the business affairs of China's large coastal population centers. Whoever controlled China's port cities exercised a powerful influence on the country's overall economic structure. The westernization of China's population centers had a profound effect on the country as a whole. China's principal cities in the 20th century had a decidedly occidental caste. The lives of a considerable percentage of China's population were directly affected by the beginnings of the machine age in China. One of the most important aspects of China's modernization was the introduction of progressive methods in the manufacture of textiles. But modern methods prevailed only in a few major cities. Throughout most of China, traditional procedures were still followed. 
For even in the 20th century, China remained thoroughly oriental in the conduct of its affairs. Many Chinese merchants still transacted their business chiefly in the local tea house. All classes of Chinese men enjoyed the luxury of spending a few hours at the tea house, where the patrons discussed all their problems, social as well as business, with anyone who cared to listen. Through the years, the local tea house became an informal extension of the magistrate's court. China's mode of life bore many striking resemblances to the manners of earlier generations. China's fortunes took an abrupt turn in 1911, when the Chinese empire was overthrown by supporters of Dr. Sun Yat-sen, on whose political principles the young republic was founded. A disciple of Dr. Sun, Chiang Kai-shek, dedicated himself to the task of extending the revolution throughout China. America's interest in China, which dates back a number of generations, increased steadily through the early years of the 20th century. The men of the U.S. Asiatic fleet became familiar figures in all China's coastal cities. To many of the men, China provided the best liberty ports in the Eastern Hemisphere, if not in the world. And business was always good when the fleet was in. The regular visits of U.S. warships were made chiefly for diplomatic reasons. The appearance of a cruiser like the Augusta even on a friendly call, could hardly fail to leave a vivid impression of U.S. military capabilities. But there were other visitors in China's harbors. Japanese warships, ignoring diplomacy, simply occupied China's key ports. For the center of influence in the Orient was shifting to the north and east. Japan was taking a more and more active part in Far Eastern affairs. The rise of the Japanese nation as a world power was closely linked with the religious convictions of its people. For the Japanese believed that they were ordained by the gods to grow sufficiently strong to rule the earth one day. Much of the ritual was dedicated by the Japanese Shinto priests to the interests of the imperial government. In these ceremonies, the people celebrated their national unity, their patriotism, their prosperity, the seasons of the year, the abundance of their crops and any other aspects of their national life which seemed fitting. The principal aims of the state Shinto cult were to obtain support for the state, effect national solidarity, and create strength in critical periods. To the Occidental, the Japanese concept of existence was difficult to understand. In fact, until the mid-19th century, Japan and its people were virtually a complete mystery to the world at large. The home islands of Japan proper, although not large in total area, have supported a population of millions throughout recorded history. Every available square foot of land was carefully developed to provide the people with enough food for a bare existence. The basic social unit in Japan is the family whose members have grown accustomed to living frugally. In the face of hardship, the Japanese have long been a stoic race. Women had a humble status in the Japanese household. But among the poorer classes, the differences in social standing were less rigid. From the earliest years of Nipponese history, the men have been great fishermen. The export of marine products has been a thriving industry since Nippon resumed contact with the outside world. During the early decades of the 20th century, Japan stepped up the development of all her industries. Foreign influences had a considerable effect in the shaping of modern Japan. 
Life in her large cities came to bear some resemblance to that in Occidental commercial centers. The reorganization of the currency system in the late 19th century eliminated the confusion resulting from the use of several types of money. A stabilized banking system provided evidence to the public of the strength and efficiency of the government administration. Although it took some time to achieve the readjustment from the old way of operating, the conversion to modern methods was made rapidly once the nation's business with foreign countries increased. The telephone, introduced in Japan in 1877, helped materially in bringing the country back into the orbit of world affairs. With their typical enthusiasm for anything new, the people soon became addicted to the use of the mystifying gadget. Once begun, the westernization of the home islands of Japan quickly gained momentum. As soon as they had become aware of what life was like outside their country, the Japanese addressed themselves to the task of imitating that life wherever possible. Once completely secluded, the Japanese now seemed obsessed with the desire to prove themselves as progressive as any people, any place in the world. But this craze for Western ideas did not completely transform Japan. Its cultural life remained virtually unaffected by Western influences. In the Western world's 20th century after Christ, Japan stood at the threshold of a new era. The cult of emperor worship was appropriated by a small but powerful militarist clique, which adopted the doctrine of extending Japan's borders by force if necessary. As the militarists gained greater control, all Japan was geared to the new program of expansion by aggression, and the energies of all Japanese were directed toward the building of a strong national fighting spirit. But the development of the fighting spirit was not limited to adults. Japanese children were carefully indoctrinated in the glories of war. The code of Bushido, the way of the warrior, was eagerly instilled in Japanese who were still moppets. Active military training began at the age of six. From the beginning, the children were taught that it was an honor to die for the emperor, that they must become the equal in fighting ability of three soldiers of any other nation. Military training of grade schoolboys was a required part of their education. No doubt was left in the mind of any young boy that he was destined to fight and die for his country. By the time they reached their teens, Japanese youths were well prepared for their one mission in life. The warlike spirit was, by now, well nurtured. At every side, the young soldiers were acclaimed as divinely inspired warriors. As the recruits approached young manhood, their training was intensified. Every technique of modern warfare was drilled into the young soldiers. For accomplishment in the use of the newest weapons was vital if the enemies of the emperor were to be annihilated. The process of turning the young recruits into warriors was a complex one, but no effort could be spared in the development of the imperial fighting forces. And during the fateful fourth decade of the 20th century, complete control of the Japanese empire fell to the militarists. General Hideki Tojo, 
and Yosuke Matsuoka gave impetus to a movement which was geared to one course of action. Barely six weeks after Tojo became premier, the Pacific world was plunged into a cataclysmic war. 